Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, winers, diners, and oil refiners, welcome along to the Joe Spiver YouTube channel, where we discuss books and little else. And welcome back to Random Reviews, folks, where we um, detain, befriend, apprehend, uh, ensnare, and then uh, 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 fundamentally cull and um, lay out on our surgeon's table a work of uh, uh, canonical repute and a, 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 a penguin classic, usually. And um, yeah, sort of take out its entrails, see what's going on, and um, yeah, just, just, just see what's driven the writer to, to, to compose that work. And today is no different, folks. We have Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, written and published in 1847, I do believe. Uh, please call me up on that if I've got my dates uh, uh, incorrect. Um, but yes, that, that, that's what we're going to be reviewing. Goodness knows when this video will be released into the world because um, it would appear that, uh, you know, mobile internet or whatever has uh, uh, completely abandoned us here in Kingston upon Hull. Um, the questions and, uh, yeah, the questions and provocations that I've been typing into Google may as well have been catawalled at a Cornish pasty this morning, folks. It has been completely useless and, um, yeah, I don't know when it is that things will be back up. There is a bit of Wi-Fi, it's, there's clearly some connectivity there, um, but it's not getting any results and I, I can't share things, uh, uh, you know, dis despite how hard I try. But anyway, hopefully this goes up on Tuesday, the, what are we on, the 27th of February, hopefully it's up then, that's when I'm, that's at, certainly when I'm recording it. But yes, this is Jane Eyre, and usually when I review one of these uh, canonical classics, I sort of, I give you a little bit of a whistle-stop tour of the narrative, I usually sort of make a, a verbal and condensed Wikipedia page, and uh, then we, and then I sort of, in, and then at the end, I give you, a, yeah, I give you a sort of jamboree of quotations, and then we we talk about that. Um, but that's going to be a little bit different today. I've got six, five or six sections that I want. To, I'm halfway through. Um, so this is only part one. I've got uh, five or six sections that I want to point out, and then um, use that, that use those as sort of lily pads along which to jump, rather than just bombarding you with, um, you know, a terrible uh, depiction of the plot. Um, so yes. Let us begin. Um, this is the story of, of, of Jane, the eponymous Jane Eyre, who is inwardly sort of resilient and um, just tenacious, but is also but is but is outwardly mild mannered and, and mild tempered, um, and is as expected of most females below the age of fifteen at the time. Um, never sought to offend anybody. Was was yeah, complete, very very tepid um, and very even quite submissive. If you're not going to um, obfuscate that sentence by, by uh, sort of making it a sexual connotation. She's very submissive. And um, yes, so that's, that's the young Jane Eyre that we meet. She has, uh, she is the product of a, um, a, an incoherent home, as I think we would dub it today. She, uh, her mother and father have died, and she's been put in the care of Mrs. Reed, who is um, a right horrible so-and-so, as well we'll come to uh, realise. So the first section that I wanted to point, wanted to draw your att our attention to, the first one that I wanted to dissect was um, Jane's realisation. She's, she's very perceptive, very perceptive from a very young age. Obviously, it's a first person, uh, it's, it's got a first person narrator, and it's clearly Charlotte Bronte writing, and Jane Eyre is supposed to be writing this when she's 30 or 40 or whatever, presumably a lot lot older than the subject in question here. Um, but she's she very perceptive and notices the disparity between um, a person's objective worth and their uh, manifestations of their character and the treatment that they receive from some of their family and their elders. Um, so let's, let's get into the first bit. So this is talking about horrible people who receive excellent treatment from their family. Um, and, and inversely, why she is a, a perfectly meritable uh, young woman and is treated with disdain. Um, why could I never please? Why was it useless to try to win anyone's favour? Eliza, who was headstrong and selfish, was respected. Georgiana, who had a spoiled temper, a very acrid spite, a captious and insolent carriage, was universally indulged. Her beauty, her pink cheeks and golden curls, seemed to give delight to all who looked at her and to purchase indemnity for every fault. John, no one thwarted, much less punished, though he twisted the necks of the pigeons, killed the little pea chicks, set the dogs at the sheep, stripped the hothouse vines of their fruit, and broke the buds off the choicest plants in the conservatory. He called his mother old girl too, sometimes reviled her for a dark skin similar to his own, bluntly disregarded her wishes, not unfrequently tore and spoiled her silk attire, and he was still her own darling. I dared commit no fault. I strove to fulfil every duty, and I was termed naughty and tiresome, sullen and sneaking, from morning to noon and from noon to night. Um, again, a great encapsulation of what it feels like to be in a, 
um, a home or environment that just does not want you there, that wants to spit you out as an inferior and a deplorable. Um, so yes, very, very nice there from Miss Bronte. Uh, next up, we look at, again, at the loneliness that she feels. I think it's called, I think it's Gateshead. And um, yeah, she, she has not a friend in the world and um, anthropomorphizes a, a small doll, essentially. So this is the next section. Um, to this crib, I always took my doll. Human beings must love something. And in the dearth of worthier objects of affection, I contrived to find a pleasure in loving and cherishing a faded graven image, shabby as a miniature scarecrow. It puzzles me now to remember with what absurd sincerity I doted on this little toy, half fancying it alive and capable of sensation. I could not sleep unless it was folded in my nightgown, and when it lay there safe and warm, I was comparatively happy, believing it to be happy likewise. Um, and again, uh, what greater encapsulation of um, despondent youth could we have when, when, when none of us have any friends, when we're, when we're playing in the, in the garden with, with not a sibling or friend to note, um, and we, yeah, as I say, anthropomorphize a football or, 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 or you know, make live a doll. Um, so yeah, Charlotte Bronte is really doing some very nice things here. And sooner or later, um, she is whipped off to a school. Um, she finds herself a school. She's, she's put in a red room when punished, and there's a bit of, uh, there are demonic connotations to that. I don't really read an awful lot into it. It's worth stating that this book first came under my nose when I was... Um, doing my GCSEs, which I don't know what the American equivalent would be, um, but they're the ones before sixth form college. So they're the precursor to the precursor to university um, here in Britain. So I was, what, 16? Um, and as per usual with everything that was put onto our nose at secondary school, um, it was supposed to be a work which proved the immutable malevolence of mankind. And by mankind, I mean men. Um, that, that we have not met a, 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 some, a, 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 a recommendable or, or in any way um, good uh, a male uh, uh, at um, halfway during this book. And um, so this was utilised to every single extent that it could um, by one of my teachers, whose name I will not utter here. Um, so yes, that was what was rammed down our throats from the ages of 15 and 16. Um, and I just thought it was sort of worth pointing that out. But she's, she's put out to school, she goes to school, and um, addresses or, or um, is met with the, the most assiduous and deferential obedience um, by, I think it's about 80, 80 young girls and women um, who are in the charge of, their name is going to evade me, but I'm going to try and fill the stop gap by talking English whilst also cogitating and thinking who it is that's in charge. I'm never going to remember who it is that's in charge. Um, but yes, nonetheless, oh, Mr. Brocklehurst, there we go, Mr. Brocklehurst, got there in the end. Um, and she, yeah, what, what comes across very strongly in these opening pages is the um, unwavering sort of self-abnegation of these young girls. They go through comparative hell, relative hell, to what anybody who is born um, you know, who, who isn't born in sub-Saharan Africa these days would feel, or in the depths of Russian oppression. Um, they, they, they have the worst life possible. They wake up with cold feet and cold hands and, you know, have 15 minutes of idle pleasure per day and the rest of it is spent having, you know, getting the thinnest gruel down your neck in the hour that you've got to eat and then going ahead and, you know, revising Voltaire and speaking French and, you know, paying lip service and extolling the virtues of your um, just uh, uh, ridiculously cruel tutors. Um, and yet they take this with a shine. They, 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 they take this with a sort of British stiff upper lip and, um, uh, you know, a sort of, yeah, a, a, um, a, a, a selfless uh, a service. And it's, it's really remarkable to read about. Um, and so she, she takes a shining to, to a, a girl called Helen Burns, who I've always imagined, this is probably the third time I've read this, I've always imagined to be a really short girl with a sort of ginger, fair-haired, sort of auburn bob, uh, somebody not particularly pretty, much like Jane, which is obviously what we're supposed to get from it there. There she is in her little throne. Oh, look, she's a bit flavourless, isn't she? She's not very attractive. Oh, God, I don't fancy her. That's usually the impression we're supposed to get anyway. Um, but yes, she goes off to a school and um, Helen Burns dies as a result of typhus. Again, spoiler alert. Um, and yes, soon when um, one of the, her fine tutors leaves, she becomes a teacher for two years, but then sends off for employment um, with a Miss Fairfax at Thornfield Hall. Um, they need a governess for a small girl called Adele. She's a, a, a French girl who has been on uh, Albion's Isle, I think, but two years when we meet her. Um, so she's going to be a, a governess to teach English and a bits of French and all sorts of 
um, you know, necessary tuition uh, to this young French girl, and she arrives at Thornfield and um, hears of Mr. Rochester, who owns the place, but is on the continent rather a lot, and um, yeah, doesn't sp doesn't spend uh, usually much longer than a, a fortnight's period at Thornfield, um, and, the, and here the Byronic implications or connotations, or at least um, the you, you can feel Byron's hands pressing into our shoulder blades here. Um, he is a um, what is he? He's, he's he's not irreverent, but he's he's got a an enigmatic past. Um, he's somebody who has you know ridden roughshod over the Judeo Christian moral codes on the continent. Um, has a child out of wedlock. Is uh, it sort of inspires trepidation in everybody else that, uh, with whom he communicates. All that type of thing is quite brusque and has uh, 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 unkept hair and is isn't. The, 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 the bit that I pointed out, or I, that I uh, detected uh, most prominently, was Charlotte Bronte insisting that Rochester isn't attractive. He's not um, prepossessing, or no, he's prepossessing, but he's not. He's not stunning um, as you know some pink-shirted, centre-parted booktubers sometimes appear to be. He's not alluring. He doesn't. You know, he wouldn't get on the cover of Vogue today, for instance. Or do males ever get on the cover of Vogue? Or of um, um, goodness knows what magazine, a male magazine, Men's Health. Um, so this is the, the, the original uh, description of him. Uh, yada, yada, yada. He had a dark face with stern features and a heavy brow. His eyes and gathered eyebrows looked ireful and thwarted just now. Just let that sink in. Ireful and thwarted just now. He was past youth, but had not reached middle age. Perhaps he might be 35. I had felt no fear of him and but little shyness. Uh, had he been a handsome, heroic-looking young gentleman, I should not have dared to stand thus questioning him against his will and offering my services unasked. I had hardly ever seen a handsome youth, never in my life spoken to one. I had a theoretical reverence and homage for beauty, elegance, gallantry, fascination, but had I met those qualities incarnate in masculine shape, I should have known instinctively that they neither had nor could have sympathy with anything in me, and should have shunned them and... Uh, and shunned them as one would fire, lightning, or anything else that is bright but antipathetic. And there you can see there from my diaphragm being exercised that that was a, uh, a typically Victorian sentence in its length. Um, that lasted, I think, the best part, yeah, that's about half a page um, for one sentence, barely allowing a breath. Um, so that was that was the, the original description of Rochester. Um, but interestingly as well, um, he references Rochester but doesn't admit to being him. He falls off his horse, um, it skids on the ice, and Jane is... I think she's posting a letter or she's just sort of walking about whimsically in the moonlight and helps him and, um, yeah, references Rochester and, 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 and she acknowledges that she is at Thornfield Hall, but he never admits to being it. It is only when she gets back there later on and he's sort of smouldering into the flames in the, by the fireside um, that she realises that the person she has just helped on the road is in fact her um, benefactor, I suppose it'd be, it'd be called. And then they have a conversation about affectation and duplicity and personal deportment and um, yeah phoniness and uh, pretense and uh, you know intellectual endeavor and he, he asks her straight up do you think I'm very handsome and um, she offers a rebuttal really and just just replies with no um, <coughs> and yet yeah, she is as Rochester picks up and perceives very, very uh, 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 meditative on the inside. She, she's, she never misses a moment whatsoever. And um, yeah, she is absolutely remarkable. And um, this is this is the conversation that they have. My phone is losing charge. Um, where are you going? Um, to put a Adele to bed. It's past her bedtime. You're afraid of me because I talk like a sphinx. Your language is enigmatical, sir, but though I am bewildered, I'm certainly not afraid. You are afraid. Your self-love dreads a blunder. In that sense, I do feel apprehensive. I have no wish to talk nonsense. If you did, it would be in such a grave, quiet manner. I should mistake it for sense. Do you ever laugh, Miss Eyre? Don't trouble yourself to answer. I see you laugh rarely, but you can laugh very merrily. Believe me, you are not naturally austere any more than I am naturally vicious. The lowered constraint still clings to you somewhat, controlling your features, muffling your voice, and restricting your limbs. And you fear, in the presence of a man and a brother, or father or master, or what you will, to smile too gaily, speak too freely, or move too quickly. But in time, I think you will learn to be natural with me, as I find it impossible to be conventional with you. I find it impossible to be conventional with you. And then your looks and movements will have more vivacity and variety than they dare offer now. I see it intervals the glance of a curious sort of bird through the close-set bars of a cage. A vivid, restless, resolute captive is there. Were it but free, I would, uh, it would soar cloud high. You are still bent on going. 
Goodness me, what a conversation that is, folks. Absolutely glorious, folks, glorious. Um, so yes, Rochester is at, at, at first, um, you know, really rather, uh, 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 I want to say the word dolorous, but I don't actually know the word meaning of it. It's come in, the, it's, it, it, it flitted across my cerebral cortex just then, and I'm going to use it, but I'm not sure it's quite apposite. But yeah, he seems uh, uh, intimidating at first, and um, terse, and somebody a few words, but eventually uh, Jane Eyre brings it out in him, as it were. Um, but then the, the final bit that I wanted to highlight was when he uh, uh, jollies off to the, to the nearest aristocratic country seat, and comes back with a load of fine ladies and gentlemen who have a soiree and sort of jitter about and, um, you know, follow him around and tug at his coattails. And the uh, lady whose favour Jane Eyre perceives as well is um, Miss Ingram, who is the usual sort of jittery, affectatious, fake, um, superficial, mindless, and yet relatively attractive young lady who she thinks Mr. Rochester will um, enamour or, or, or will in both enamour and love himself. Um, so this is talking about, again, that, that, that difference between people who have the opportunity to have a go at something or someone who have the opportunity to, to grasp Mr. Rochester and yet don't warrant it with their personality and Jane Eyre who is obviously societally barred from having a conversation with him or seeming to delight in his presence and yet he's very able to do so and is, as, as I say, societally barred from that. Um, so this is talking about uh, Miss Ingram. So this is, again, Jane's inner feelings. If she had managed the victory at once, that's the victory of Rochester, and he had yielded and sincerely laid his heart at her feet, I should have covered my face, turned to the wall and figuratively had died to them. If Miss Ingram had been a good and noble woman endowed with force, fervour, kindness, sense, I should have led one vital struggle with two tigers. Jealousy and, spare, and despair. Then, my heart torn out and devoured, I should have admired her, acknowledged her excellence and been quiet for the rest of my days. And the more absolute her superiority, the deeper would have been my admiration, the more truly tranquil my quiescence. But as matters really stood, to watch Miss Ingram's efforts at, at, efforts at fascinating Mr. Rochester, to witness their repeated failure, herself unconscious that they did fail, vainly fancying that each shaft launched, it, launched hit the mark, and infatuatedly pluming herself on success, when her pride and self-complacency repelled further and further what she wished to allure. To witness this was to be at once under ceaseless excitation and ruthless restraint. So there you can see uh, Jane Eyre absolutely picking to bits the um, uh, 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 sort of thoroughly counterproductive methods of um, attracting a male from Miss Ingram there. Um, so yes, that, that pretty much covers my first half of Jane Eyre. He has just impersonated a, a gypsy clairvoyant in order to essentially just have five minutes in the same room with Jane Eyre. And um, yeah, we sense obviously that there is some frisson, some tete-a-tete, -tete, some um, unpronounced, uh, some, uh, yeah, some unpronounced attraction between the two, some mutual affection. Um, and we're essentially just waiting for it to be kindled and then to form into one big, bright, glowing uh, conflagration. So yes, that has been my first look at Jane Eyre. Hopefully this can go out on time, uh, because I am at the moment in the uh, connected and technological wilderness. Um, but yes, I'm pretty much going to cap this video just after 18 minutes, folks. And uh, yes, keep your comments coming. Do you like Jane Eyre? Is it marvellous? Were you taught it at school? Did you pick it up in middle age? Um, all of those questions need asking and answering, um, and I look forward to reading them in the comments as ever. Thank you ever so much for watching, BookTube, and goodbye.